usually uh, they come out uh, in black on black and uh, so that's why i'm asking um yeah so welcome to the virtual vancouver friday so uh this is a meeting that we were planning to have in vancouver and you all know why it's now uh, online and we cut this down to three hours uh, um, this doesn't mean we have to use the entire three hours but we have uh, reserved uh, three hours and uh, uh, one of the things that, that the research group uh, does a lot is uh, bring together different uh, groups and, and try to find out how we can make progress together. Uh, we just had one of these events on, on uh, Wednesday this week where we talked with uh, OCF about some security um, issues and uh, this uh, workshop um, is uh, intended to be a little bit uh, wider, more long term uh, in view because we are not talking about specific standards that already exist or are nearing completion, uh, but we are talking about uh, standards that are being created as, as we speak. And the, the two groups we bring together here is on, on one hand the, the 1BM liaison group. Uh, which doesn't really exist, um, just like the IETF didn't, didn't exist for its uh, first 50 years or so. Um, and uh, that, that group is uh, a somewhat informal meeting of people from different uh, Internet of Things, standards development organizations, and uh, they are trying to get common data models <coughs> for IoT devices established when we say data models we usually include interaction models we are a little bit uh, uh, sloppy with our terminology here but for for today i think that that's uh, pretty much okay um so that that's one vm and and uh, one vm is uh, amazingly successful in that they have uh, both a set of of uh, a three digit set of uh, data models that, that are nearing completion, as well as a common idea of a language that is used to represent those um, data models. So that, that's a really interesting uh, group. And on the other hand, we have the Think to Think Research Group, which is a research group inside the IRTF, which is ITF's research arm. And uh, we are interested in bringing researchers and standards developers together to uh, get progress on, on the long-term problem of a true Internet of Things. So the IETF is creating standards, and uh, we are looking at what, what's missing, what are the gaps, uh, what needs to be done, not necessarily done within the IETF, uh, but some of uh, uh, the gaps we find, of course, uh, will then be addressed uh, by, by the IETF. So that, that's the, the background for today's uh, meeting. And uh, in, in Vancouver uh, time, uh, we are starting with the introduction. This is the 10 minutes here. Um, and uh, we have three uh, big uh, headlines. We have versioning and evolution as one headline. We want to spend half an hour on that. Uh, we have uh, 1DM key technical issues, and I neglected to actually update. Uh, this properly. Um, so we we have uh, the the major part of the time uh, for that, from uh, 9.40 to 11.20. And uh, in the end, uh, we should spend some time about uh, prospects of actually getting standardization going for SDF, for the language 1DM has defined. And uh, yeah, look at how you, the IETF could be useful uh, for that and what are the next process steps we have to do to, to make that happen. And uh, yeah, then we have a little bit of time for a wrap up, uh, seeing whether we want to do this again uh, and so on. Uh, we want to have a, a 10 minute break in the middle. Now this is in the middle of Michael's time. So at, at some point we should just say, uh, okay, Michael, our, our, our brains are on, are on overload. We need a 10 minute break. Uh, and uh, uh, so the, the, the time that is 
taken down here isn't really 100 minutes, it's only 90 minutes, and uh, there need to be some, some 10 minutes uh, in there. And uh, we will nudge you, Michael, to we'll actually start this 10-minute uh, break. Are there any comments on the agenda? Okay. Uh, logistics, uh, the, the pointer to the uh, uh, live nodes that uh, we are taking in HackMD. HackMD is a kind of either pair just for, for Markdown documents, um, is in the, the WebEx chat and on the slides here. And uh, well, you, you wouldn't hear this if you didn't know about the WebEx meeting, so I, I don't have to say anything about that. So that's the introduction. Anything else on the logistic side? Ah, so if you uh, hear me not speaking for a while, this is me muted and coughing a little bit. Uh, I hope it's not, not that coughing. Um, good, so let's uh, start with the, the first item on the agenda. Uh, we have been talking about uh, versioning and, and evolution uh, for a while in the uh, research uh, group. We have this, this thing in the research group, which is called the WISHI. Um, Ari, can you expand that abbreviation for me? Work on yeah. IoT, semantic, and hypermedia interoperability in some order. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we, we tend to have a call a month or maybe twice a month uh, on, on some issues and on, on two of these calls we have been discussing uh, versioning already. And it, it turns out that, that evolution and, and therefore the need for versioning, revisions, features, whatever, comes up at, at the number of different levels um, in the uh, 1DM uh, uh, activity and one of that is of course that the models themselves evolve over time of course they evolve during initial development uh, that's maybe when we need a slightly more sloppy form of versioning but we do need some versioning there and uh, then at some point they, they get agreed but of course they, they do get uh, fixes they, they get additional features and so on so they evolve and we have to have a way to handle this evolution in such a way that not every change is, is uh, extremely expensive and disruptive uh, and so on. So that's one area of evolution <clears throat> that we need to manage. And the other one is that the SDF language uh, that we are using to represent uh, these models, uh, this language will also evolve. This will get new features. I hope we will manage to stay completely backward compatible um, over time, but even that is, is not a given. Um, so we want to be able to have different versions of uh, SDF uh, coexist uh, in, in one ecosystem where we might have uh, data models that, that have been developed at different times uh, based on different versions of that uh, language. So this is not about evolving the models itself. Of course, model evolution has to interact with this, uh, but about uh, evolving the uh, language. Um, so the, these are the, the two things. I, I'm, I'm going to make a little bit more detailed um, uh, distinctions uh, later, uh, but uh, we have to keep that in mind. Also during the development of 1DM, it's, it's often confusing we talk about things like schemas and, and never remember to say, are we talking about the schema that is part of the model to describe the data that, that are being exchanged as part of this model? Or are we talking about the schema that defines the syntax of the language? Uh, bo both are schemas and, and it can become very confusing. So we have to be a little bit uh, careful to, to always say which, which level we are uh, arguing uh, on. <clears throat> so, I have said versioning all the time, and um, actually, uh, after about 40 years of, of doing this, 
um, in, in various uh, protocols and environments, it has become clear that, that versioning is not necessarily exactly uh, what you want because versioning was invented for, for software. But this is not software. This is an interface definition between two software components or multiple software components that, that evolve on their own timelines. So it has turned out that we actually often uh, can better describe the evolution of, of some interface in terms of features. So which new features are there uh, that, that weren't there before? And features might take the form of a simple capability indication. So uh, one end of the communication says, uh, oh, oh, by the way, I understand this new data format or the, this uh, uh, new interaction uh, pattern. Uh, and so on. So it's it's kind of a unidirectional announcement, and it's only becoming actionable when it's actually uh, um, operated by the peer. So a peer that simply ignores the capability indication uh, doesn't need to know about that capability indication because it's not going to use that capability. So that's one kind of feature, and the other one is one where uh, actually, the, the fact that a feature is part of the communication uh, really changes that communication. So if, if the, the members of the group agree that they all speak French, uh, after that we might want to start speaking French. And, and then people who come in and don't know what French is uh, or don't know the, the language uh, will not be able to communicate. So that, that's a very different kind of uh, feature. It's one that, that really is more of an agreement uh, than, than a simple capability indication. And we often are negotiating uh, features, um, but sometimes we are simply using them. And the most important uh, aspect of evolution here is to prevent false interoperability. So when somebody says a sentence in French, we, we need to avoid somebody else acting on that uh, just because the same sentence also has a meaning in German or whatever. So preventing false interoperability is one of the, the most important uh, concepts in the feature of version uh, uh, mechanism. So what is a version then? Well, a version essentially is a feature or set of features uh, that, that have been blessed a bit, so, so people are willing to talk about them um, collectively using some, some version number. And uh, then we just straight jacket those features into a linear uh, space, which is very natural when you think about evolution of a single piece of software, because th that software has that feature implemented or it doesn't have it uh, implemented. But uh, this happens in, in linear time, to a certain extent at least. Uh, so it makes sense to say, oh, this is version two, and this has the following three uh, additional uh, features. So that makes sense for software. It makes much less sense uh, for an, an interaction specification. But still, it's sometimes nice to just roll up a number of features in particular if they are interdependent in some way. Uh, so you might have something like a feature SDF 2.0, which would mean that there is a number of features that we now take for granted in, in any new uh, um, models that, that use this uh, newly versioned uh, dialect <clears throat> of, of the language. So that's a version. And then I have a third term I, I want to throw at you, which is revision. So the, the specific files that, that make up, uh, I could say data objects, but I'm, I'm going to, to make it really grounded by saying files. Um, these might have revisions. So I'm, I'm changing the order of something in the model that makes things easier to understand for a human reader of the model, but doesn't change its semantics. Or I'm fixing a typo in, in a, a comment or in a semantic, uh, if in an English language uh, a description or something like that. Uh, so that's a revision. Uh, that is not necessarily creating a new version. Well, that's, of course, not true for all typo fixes. So we just had a, a big fix where we changed the spelling of the word writable. 
and uh, of course uh, uh, you need to know whether you are using the old version or the new version when you make a revision uh, like this but i think the important thing to to keep in mind is that uh, the, the the lexical state of a file that, that is used in this environment, uh, a model, um, a data model, or maybe even the, the, the schema that defines the syntax of the SDF uh, language, changing that doesn't mean that we change the interface. And all the versioning and, and feature string stuff we are doing should be about uh, uh, making progress on, on interfaces. So to make this uh, specific, in a model, <clears throat> we might also uh, introduce features. So we might have a lamp, and that lamp might or might not have an RGB feature. Uh, and depending on that, its behavior is going to be different. That's uh, another thing that, that is relevant for evolution because uh, very often you do model uh, evolution in a backwards compatible way so you you know you need to know whether a specific implementation actually had that feature or not um, so th there is a difference between the capability of a model and the capability of an implementation that implements uh, this model and again we are going to do roll-ups here at some point so at some point uh, we say we have a completely new version of a model that, that uh, uh, unifies a, a number of uh, uh, features. And on the language side, um, this is really interesting because any particular model that we are looking at is going to use one specific language. Uh, so it, it's, there is no negotiation. It's just going to say, I need features A, B, and C. And, uh, well, sometimes you have uh, conditional parts of a specification um, and so on, but uh, usually you, you try to avoid that complexity. So a model will declare, will simply unidirectionally declare which features uh, it um, assumes, and that's then an interpretation uh, requirement. And of course, there, there may be optional uh, things, uh, still things that can be ignored uh, so if you don't know what a protocol binding is, then you don't really care about features that relate to, to protocol bindings. Now, one interesting thing that also happens is uh, these models need to live somewhere and get names. And then you reference a model by name uh, from a different place. So for instance, we might include definitions from one model specification into another uh, specification. That would be inclusion or import. Um, and uh, of course, also an actual device uh, may reference a model specification. It may not be interested in, in the specific revision uh, of, of that model, but just say, I, I implement that uh, uh, model. So sometimes we, we reference uh, documents that are meant to evolve. We do not always reference one e exact specific revision. So that's one thing the Yang people are trying to do. They are trying to attach a specific revision, revision to uh, every single Yang specification. Then when you point to a Yang specification, you need to indicate that specific uh, revision. Um, but that, of course, makes it really hard to fix a bug somewhere because you have to change all specifications that, that uh, uh, reference uh, that, that uh, specification that has been fixed. Um, in software, we usually use something called semantic versioning. Um, so you say something like, um, this is using version 2.5 of that other thing, but we don't really care whether it's 2.250 or 2.53 or something. Please use the newest one you have. Um, yeah, that, that can have some, some interesting consequences in, in uh, an interface uh, specification. And that is, of course, also orthogonal to, to the question, which of the features of a reference specification are actually used? Uh, so you may want to say, I'm, I'm using that specification over there, but only feature X and 
I don't care whether feature Y is in, in there or not. So versioned references are an, imp an important part of the versioning uh, model. Now let's talk about the interfaces where we need all this stuff. Um, as I said, the specification uh, uses an, a version of the language um, and the language may have evolved and may have um, got additional features. And this is not just a matter of the language uh, specification having evolved. You also want to know uh, whether the language implementation you are uh, using actually implements all the features you need to, to run this model specification. And um, it's usually rather expensive to, to have a specification evolve and require that all implementations implement all new features. And th th that is typically something that, that then simply doesn't happen in reality. And uh, so it, it's much better to say, okay, we, we, this is an SDF 2.0 uh, specification, but we only really use the features A and B, and we don't care whether the implementation actually uses uh, feature C. Um, so th that's something that, that may be useful to make, the, make it easier for an implementer uh, to manage the evolution of the language they implement. So this is one interface, and there we need versioning of feature indications for the language. And the other one is the um, use of model specifications uh, by uh, other model specifications, and of course, ultimately, the use of a model specification by a device definition. Um, so uh, we need to find out whether we want to indicate a specific revision here to be on the safe side, indicate some semantic versioning to have a way to fix some bugs, indicate features. I think that that's really the the uh, the most interesting uh, part here. How can a, a lamp say, uh, "I'm a lamp, and uh, I'm using that model over there," and um, actually I'm, I'm also offering certain features here. I'm requiring certain features um, that uh, uh, from the model that uh, uh, may not be required by by other people. Okay, so this was my, my quick introduction into the subject. And uh, now, of course, uh, I would be very interested in, in hearing uh, what your point of view is, what we should be doing around the, the versioning and evolution issues uh, of the SDF language and the models described in it. Right. Wow. Thank you. <clears throat> that um, actually, it really makes sense to think of these things not, you know, as you just pointed out, not as like uh, how you version something, but from the point of use of the version. So the references and understanding how the references to a version are used is really uh, probably the most informative thing that we could we could do to sort of help decide how this should work. And and it medium, immediately made me think of. I do not want to have to carry around the logic, or I would prefer not to carry around the logic to uh, apply different schemas to different instances of things. It, it, it seems to be really cumbersome to, to have, you know, a set of models where different models have, are pointing to different schemas. Um, and the, the, where, where the way you use it is just by having the whole referencing the schema to validate them. It, it, you know, it's better not to have a lot of those, I guess. So there's some some informative um, uh, you know, conclusion already that or that we can kind of understand that you know the way you use them. I don't want to have to pile up a bunch of strings in a single reference, for example. So that I guess it says indicating indicating features as individual things. And I guess I have some questions, uh, right? So as capabilities versus agreements, it seems like capabilities are mostly by, by nature backward compatible. And so you might even be able to add those without changing any kind of version or, or anything and just sort of, you know, add those add, provided the right testing has been done. But then when agreements change, that's when uh, I think it, 
it, it sometimes calls into a, a more rigorous uh, review of whether you need to change a version or, you know, what's breaking and what isn't breaking, this sort of thing. Is, does that does that make sense with your thinking? The capabilities are mostly backward compatible, but when interpretations change, uh, it's more of an opportunity to break things. Yeah, if, if um, in a perfect world, the capabilities are completely orthogonal. Uh, so you can switch them all on and off and, and uh, it means something. Of course, in reality, that's not always entirely uh, true. And you might have one capability that implies uh, having another uh, capability. Um, the the interpretation agreements, of course, though th those really require preventing false interoperability. So um, th they are much more disruptive, but they are also great opportunities to clean things up. So when things moved from HTTP 1.0 to HTTP 1.1, the only place in the history of HTTP where that, that actually happened, uh, they could take out a lot of craft of the, the headers that had accumulated that you had, had to put in there uh, to, to work with both older and newer HTTP 1.0 uh, implementation. So sometimes you just want to do that to simplify uh, things. Yeah, that seems really consistent with the idea that you don't want to carry around too many different schemas, but you might need to have a, a couple to deal with cases like that. Some good examples. I have a question. Um, how do you deal with uh, systems that are in, interestingly dynamic, uh, where a feature um, could be time-based. So something is very important now, but it may not be important tomorrow because we're in an industrial uh, environment or something to that. So is there a, so my question is, are these versioning and features uh, could be uh, time-limited or time-based or um, time-stamped to to make the difference between current information and stale information. One case of that is deprecated features. So if you want to remove a feature and you want to say after a certain time, this is no longer going to be supported, how would you how do you how would you represent that? I could imagine this happening more when when we talk about uh, specific features being available in a device. So the the device stops supporting TLS 1.0 because we really don't want to accept those insecurities uh, anymore, and we might want to put a date uh, on on when that happens. Uh, this is less about uh, features that a specification language. Uh, has so uh, essentially a, a specification that is using an older version of the specification language will will be around indefinitely. It, it's not going away. It's going to be in some archive uh, uh, somewhere. So it, it's harder to to talk about flag days there where where features actually uh, vanish. But of course, for new stuff, you would then say for for new specifications. Uh, please use uh, th that feature and, and don't try to work around not having it. Yeah, like Python, <laughs> Python 3. A at some point, people might start saying, oh, we don't really process Python 2 anymore, but that's not yet, you know. And so, there, But both exist and coexist. And yet there's a graceful way to phase out the older one over time, and that's probably what we want to uh, head for. But you probably have to support it sort of indefinitely, right, in, in terms of a, an organization and as a, as a standard and, and, you know, it, it doesn't just immediately stop being working everywhere. Yeah, I think it's especially important for IoT devices where you might, in fact, have brownfield devices that can't be updated for some reason, but we might want to know whether Quarantine them on an isolated network. 
I don't know if that relate how that relates exactly to this, but I think that information is, is valuable for security. And those work dynamic features that might be or may not be available location. Of course, doing discovery uh, of even occasionally or or when detecting something is changing. That's what one, one way to tackle that. It's kind of common for the hyper media based systems. Um, can people hear me because I wanted to say a few things already, but I yeah, I have one button too much. Muted. You now, Arthur. Okay. So, um, I think there is a, a huge difference in data modeling and what is actually implemented in a device. And I think the examples that are here so far is really signaling what a device can do. It has nothing to do with the data modeling and the version of the data model itself. At least that's my grasp of what we're trying to do with SDF. So what can be implemented uh, or what is defined in a data model uh, and what can be implemented can already be a subset. And it's up to the ecosystem to convey what is the subset. And of course, all the required elements of a data model needs to be somehow transported uh, for the data model. Uh, we are not talking about the interaction models and the, to detect those kind of things, at least not yet. Does that make sense? Yes, uh, but you also have to, to keep in mind that that additional feature that a device might provide, the, the, the presence and absence of which you want to model in a data model, that may not have been known at the time the model was originally defined. So you are evolving the model to be able to express the presence and absence of that feature. And that actually is a feature of the model, of the evolved model that you can do that, which you couldn't do in the earlier model. So the, the two levels of, of talking about this are actually um, interrelated in practice just because features are added over time. Yeah, so if you want to do, well, if you have a uh, model A and you want to add something as an optional, that can be done at any time. You still need to recognize that's an optional thing uh, and whether if it's um, available on that implementation or not. If you want to add something that is mandatory, then probably you should not call it uh, data model A, but data model A version two, uh, so that everybody in the, uh, it's, it's known that there is a fundamental change because something mandatory has been added to it. So that sounds, uh, like a big step, but basically you're creating a new model which encapsulates 90% or even more of the older model if you want to add something mandatory. And I think that's a normal way of of doing versioning. Right, and, and the interesting case is where you want to evolve the model, you want to make something mandatory. So for instance, uh, let's say that uh, we have now have decided all IoT devices in the future need to support TLS 1.3. Um, but of course, there's all this bound field stuff out there that doesn't know about TLS 1.3. Um, so as long as that stuff is out there, you may also want to support TLS 1.2. And uh, so you have a mandatory part in that model that the, the peer device doesn't care about because it only has TLS 1.2. So this is a, a classical feature from the device interoperability point of view. And therefore you should also be able to, to handle it like a feature on the modeling level. Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm not sure if the TLS stuff is is an example. Uh, but if you want to be compatible uh, uh, with data models, you have a client and a server. So you can have servers that just do uh, data model A, and you have also servers doing data model uh, A V1. And if you want to do it correctly on the client side, you want to understand both. And then you need to make sure that uh, for V1, the extra stuff that is mandated is handled correctly by that client. So there is some somewhat forwards compatibility thing needed um, on the client side, or at least more upgradability of the client side than from the server side. If everything would be upgradable, um, then you could do that. But in, in brownfield situations, you will never uh, have the possibility uh, that everything is upgraded to the latest version. If if you're doing it in a, in a factory, it might be, but uh, something like in a smart home, where people buy devices from different vendors. Uh, and have a good, just a mixed bunch of features. And the likelihood is that uh, device A will be uh, uh, using an older model, uh, which could have been upgraded, but it did not do that. Uh, I think that's quite common. Yeah, I agree that TLS is maybe not the best example here. That, that's maybe one of the things we might take as some work, uh, coming up with a number of good examples that actually illustrate what we are trying to do here. And so we can uh, point to those specific examples when, when we uh, explain our design decisions. I totally agree with that. We need to we need to sort of figure out what we're talking about. Also, the examples help us stay focused on whether we're talking about models or language, which seems to be the the big split here that we need to talk about versioning of both. And then, of course, how much language versioning do we embed in the models? Which was something that I think Carson mentioned earlier as being a a, a specific issue that we would need to consider. So I, I think we're. We seem to be getting, <clears throat> pardon me, we seem to be getting really well informed about, you know, what, what the issues are around versioning and, and how to do this. And maybe it's time to start talking about some, um, some straw man or design patterns for both the language and for uh, what we would call SDF models that use the SDF language. So looking at the time here, would, would this be a good spot to switch on the SDF specific issues? Because one of the issues that we were uh, planning to talk about was this versioning. Yeah, it's it's literally at the top of the list. <laughs> so Karsten, did you have more you wanted to wrap up on, on this slot? Or should, should we shall we switch now? I think we should go home with an idea of what, what we want to do uh, until we have a next meeting of, of uh, this kind. And I think uh, taking home the need for examples is, is pretty useful. Uh, but of course, in the end, I think somebody has to write this up. Uh, so I would also be looking for people who are interested in, in doing some of the writing there.
Why we don't have no Jaime in the call? I remember he started writing something in, in one context about the version. That could be a good uh, way forward. And we have quite a bit of material on, on, on the minutes where which, which we could learn something. But if there are more people interested on this topic, please do let, let us know. I think it would be very useful to write, write these thing, things down that we have a place to refer to. What do we mean by versions and features and what do we consider as a reasonable way to use those? We do have hopefully alignment across probably IoT protocols and data models on this. May also be worth pointing out that uh, uh, we are currently doing some, some we're adding some versioning considerations to the Senimal uh, data representation uh, format. So th that's an area where these considerations might might be useful right away. So if you're interested in, in that, that's going on in the core working group of the IETF. Also, if, if anyone has any good other sources where these aspects have been perhaps analyzed uh, in more detail, that will always be uh, very useful information for this work. And apologies for the background noise currently at home. No, that's good background noise. Good. Um, well, th thank you, Karsten. And um, yeah, any anyone else who's interested to work more on those, do that, let us know. Maybe now is a good time to switch then uh, on the uh, STF issues. And we could then jump perhaps straight away on, on, the, on the versioning and, and think about how should we handle versioning or, and or features in that context. So, um, Michael Koster would like to take, take the presentation. Okay. Um, well, I thought I had one up. Hang on just a second. Now, what are you seeing here? Has something weird happened with my sharing? Oh, wait, here we go. Architecture slide. There we go. <laughs> so I have both these presentations up. What what I have up over here is actually this this presentation um, that I've updated. <clears throat> but I wanted to sort of center around this because I know there are some some people on the call that maybe haven't been keeping up with every. Um, one data model meeting. So <clears throat> let me know if we need some context and I'll switch back to this deck. But um, to, to stay focused on what, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> what we wanted to, uh, what we wanted to accomplish today, we, uh, <clears throat> we had a one data model meeting earlier today and did some review of these and kind of prioritized on what, where we think the hot topics are, which are the, the bold ones at the top. But here's our whole list of, of things. And, and um, so I, I guess at this point, we need to figure out, do we need a little bit of background on one data model or should we go ahead with the technical issues based on the audience? Does anyone feel like they need to, uh, and you know, they're totally lost about what one data model is, especially after after having shown this, basically what we have is events, actions, and properties, and data types, and and um, objects and things. And you know, if, if that's not enough, um, I'm happy to explain a little more. Okay. Well, why don't we go ahead and and just you know interrupt me if there's something that we just can't figure out. I think that answers the question on hierarchy ontology, and and then we can refer back to that when when we do that discussion. So version scheme. So um, as uh, I think that's that fits the topic of something because what we're hoping to do with one data model is very soon <clears throat> um, 
come out with something that people can count on to be stable and that we can open up wider access to. Currently, the GitHub is public, so anyone really has access to it. But what we want to do is sort of start, um, start being a little more uh, consistent about our releases and policies and all that. So the version scheme is really at the heart of all this figuring out how we want to move this forward in a way that um, people can both depend on <clears throat> what things working the way they have always worked, you know, some consistency there, as well as us being able to evolve the, both the language and the, the models that use the language and in the way that's coupled appropriately, right? And so I'm not, not trying to totally decouple it, but that, I think that frames the problem. So um, version scheme for the language and version scheme for the models should you know, and would be more or less different. And I'll share my experience with, with models, what we have at SmartThings. We currently don't version individual models, but there are a number of people who think that that might be a good idea to try to do. So we're, we're almost, we're kind of having the same discussion now. What we do at SmartThings is we have a policy of saying we don't version things. This is very similar, by the way, to OMA lightweight M2M and maybe what a lot of other people do, like even OCF or whatever, in terms of the models. There are rules that you can add things that don't break what's existing. And if you change too much and make it unrecognizable or change the, the underlying contracts, then you create a different model. And we sort of, that's that's been the rule and that obviously the rule sort of <laughs> It has its limitations in, in on two fronts. It doesn't always work the way you think it would. So it has corner cases that do break and need special exceptions to handle. Plus it doesn't really, um, oh, I guess, you know, allow for the kind of evolvability that people want, I think. Um, and I don't know, you know, that, that the, that creating a new model is also a breaking change, I guess is another way of stating that. So uh, they, feel like versions might be a way of, you know, happy medium between the two and not the worst of both. So, um, but we, we don't really know about that. So that's our experience with versioning models anyway, is that we currently don't do it, but there's some framework and numbers and tags that people want to start trying to use. And so even the results of our decision here might, you know, because we're, we're hoping to contribute our models to one DM as soon as the, all the licensing can be figured out, you know, and I think we're really, really close to that. So uh, versioning models is one, one discussion. Then versioning the language, I think we have, um, we kind of have a proposal that we version the language in a, in a using semantic versioning and that we create a directory that is also a, a GitHub branch that has as its in its path somewhere the version number. So it might be something like slash uh, SDF version slash one dash one dash one, for example. And that might be a directory that points to a, that has both a schema and a markdown file. And it that that's a version of the language, if you will, and an accompanying schema. <clears throat> pardon me, an accompanying schema that validates instances of models that are said to conform to that version of the language. So that's that's the first sort of part of the proposal is that we we version the language in in terms of GitHub branches and we tag the branches and those are those are actual language releases that that look like directories that have you know, semantic versioning in their path somewhere. And the details of that can be figured out. So that's that's actually kind of a concrete proposal that we have on the table that we would do if no one objects, if, if there's not a better way to do it, et cetera. Um, when we make, when is a language version, you know, done and, and all that, it was sort of like Kirsten, I actually presented a lot of good rules for that and we could, we could you know, just have those as policies and, and, and do that. I don't know if there's a, a technical issue with, with that, but I think, you know, we need to talk that through, if, you know, if there are any. <clears throat> so versioning the language, you know, the rules would be when you, you know, maybe, maybe the rule, the, 
you know, we have to figure out the scope of changes that trigger a, a, a version and whether we want to have a lot of versions or just a few. And I would say, you know, it'd be best to have just a few versions, but we do have to have a way to evolve the language between versions. And it's not clear whether we want to have language features show up without a version number change at all. Right. So that, I think that's part of what the policy discussion or the, the sort of how it's done discussion on that. That's one factor anyway. So <clears throat> I think that's that summarizes what I know about versioning and in, in terms of where we are. So we have kind of a proposal for the language versioning. I'd hope we could add features to the language without, you know, bumping the version, but maybe that'll have to be in separate branches and, and you'd have to figure out that policy. And then for the models, um, I think that there was one further idea that was coupling the models to the versions in a way that we would have a what we call a quality in the uh, in the SDF model to distinguish it from attribute property and all those other overloaded terms. We have a quality that's a key value pair that says um, SDF version, and then it, it sort of points to that a URI that points to that version, and that's the version that this model is expected to conform to or, or to be validated against. Also, the schema that's found in that directory would validate that model. So from what I heard earlier though, and in the thinking about this, that that might have its own set of problems to require that kind of coupling. So um, I guess at this point, I'd like to get pe open up the discussion and get people's opinions on, on those three things, both the model versioning, maybe, maybe that features can be added and we, we sort of don't worry about version numbers for models right now. Um, use the backward compatibility rule. And uh, for language versions, the proposal is to have a, a GitHub branch with a schema and a markdown file and other associated supporting files in it that that um, changes when each version changes. And then also the third thing to, to require that the models point to the schema that they're expected to validate against. And those, those would presumably be backward compatible so that an older model would validate against the newer schema, but um, I guess that's subject to discussion also. So ideas, opinions, any of that really bad? Uh, let, let me just make my, my Citroen Sensio here. Um, the fact that a model complies with a specific syntax for a model is almost unrelated to the question whether it actually uses a particular version of the language. Yeah, I had a note from you saying that, and I really would like to hear more about that and elaborate on that because it doesn't, I mean, it sounds like more explanation is needed to really fully grasp that, that concept. If we fix some, some problem in the, <clears throat> meaning of the language. That may mean that, that a specific instance can be interpreted in the language before the fix and in the language after the fix and means different things there. So the, the, the fact that the, this instance, this specification instance actually validates under that schema is, is kind of nice but it's not telling me what, what version of the language I actually have been using. So the version of the language could change without the schema changing if we change the meaning of something, and that might even be just being more restrictive about something, perhaps yes. even. Mm -hmm. And vice versa. We could change the schema, the, schema the syntax. Changing. Okay, schema equals syntax, right? Yes. Yeah. We can change the syntax without changing the meaning just to fix the typo is your writable example. Right. So uh, would the playing that forward against the proposal for language versions um, and assuming that every Substantive change in the language requires a new version just for the time being. Does that mean that 
either of those would require a language change because it has a descriptive document, the markdown file, which could change the meaning of something. And also it has the schema, which, which could be changed to typos. So would we say that it's an, an inclusive or of the changes in either the meaning or the syntax that would trigger a, a language version change? I mean, that's the most, you know, restrictive. It seems like that would satisfy, that would prevent there from being conflict. Yes, in, in the general case, yes. And um, maybe <clears throat> cases where you get away without that. This is if you clarify something in the definition of the language. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the, any version or uh, update to the language uh, needs to uh, enable a, a specification to indicate that it is actually using that update. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And whether you model that update as a version number or a set of features um, mostly has has a bearing on how inexpensive it is to make a change like that. So features are always less expensive than versions. Yeah, right. And and so the only there are obviously there are editorial changes that you can go in and just change in the directory without bumping the language version. Yeah, that would be Those, revisions. Revisions, yes, revisions. But anything that adds a capability to the language or adds a feature to the language, whether it's a capability or a change in the agreement, requires a revision. It requires a, a revision, but not necessarily a new version. Not necessarily a new version. So there's a class of things that could be feature additions that don't require a version. That's what I'm interested in because that helps us limit the proliferation of versions. So if, if a language has good a good set of extension points, uh, you may be able to extend it a lot without changing the version. So for instance, in CDDL, we have this extension uh, point called a control operator. And by defining a new control operator, you can add capabilities uh, or features to the language uh, without uh, changing the version of the language. And by looking into the specification, which of these control operators actually have been used, you find out uh, which features you would need from an implementation that actually uh, implements all these features. All right, yeah, extension points. And that's, that's basically, I think, uh, it's roughly analogous to what we're doing with the, the the W3C web of things where we can have protocol bindings in a, a separate document that can be extended and changed. And there's this sort of well-known extension point that doesn't generally require updating the thing description document, even though it even though it can change the way that thing description instances are processed ultimately. But it's through a clear extension point and we we separate the versioning. So yeah, that, that's that's a good and and other architecture features that you can think of that that help with that uh, process. I mean, extension points is is one. Are there others? Well, that's that's good to know anyway. Yeah. So would that be a reasonable set of? I you know I I don't want to get too much into you know, one DM operational stuff here, but if that sounds like a reasonable set of rules to go forward with, if someone, you know, on the one DM side would, you know, could write those up about language versions and continue to use the sort of the directory method and GitHub branch and all of that, no one's objected to that, so. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, what about model versions and versions of models? What about this idea of just like what everybody's doing now? Um, you can add features 
but you can't change contracts without and just create a new model if you do. I, I'm, it seems like we have some experience with that. I know from smart things, we have some experience with that where we end up deprecating the old model eventually because people just would rather use the new model. It, it gives the, gives the uh, customer a better experience. <laughs> so, you know, uh, it's not that hard to get people to switch over, but it takes time. You can't just force people to go and write software and release it on, on your schedule. They have to do it on theirs. So those are that all those intervals vary across the different vendors you work with and all of that. So it's the same. I think it's the same thing with us. Um, is there any, is there any discussion on that or any ideas about um, refining the rules or how we should deal with that? Because I think we could, could start writing that down too. I mean, what, what, so maybe we should just have some, a little open discussion also on, you know, if we were to, try to version the models themselves would would that cause an unnecessary sort of overhead and in, in managing things hmm. okay well maybe there's not really a lot of a lot of controversy here that, that would be good news <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm afraid <laughs> might 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 be might be more because uh, I think at least the revision information uh, also like for language also for the models is useful. Um, but then how that how and whether that relates to the versions is is, is another thing. So the way they do some specs, I think it's lightweight M to M is you have both the date and the version in the string and the date can change without the version GitHub version changing. Is that is that am I right about that? They they do something there that changes. Hmm. So in, in only we're versions. right yeah, in only we're right now reconsidering the version modeling model. And that, that is uh, it's, a, it's an interesting ongoing uh, debate. What's the best way of doing that? Uh, versioning the models. I, I remember that discussion. Yes. Okay. Um, well, yes. what what are the thoughts on that from from your your angle? So no, no final conclusions that I could uh, deliver from from OMA side. I mean, I think. Klaus is here on, on the call. Klaus, for example, presented one good set of guidelines that is currently uh, being considered in, in OMA. Um, but one thing that I guess what we have agreed on that we, we need, do need a way if we are deprecating models, as you indicated, uh, that we are doing, for example, in smart things, you do need a way, way to indicate whether either on the model that has deprecated the old model or in the old model something has been deprecated. Uh, that you have um, probably that's a new revision of, of a model because it doesn't really change the interface, but you have a, something indicating there that this model, there's a new model that replaces this model. And of course, the, yeah, the one way of doing that is with the, with the version numbers. But since that, is, that version numbers have their own issues, uh, this kind of a, a pointer to the new version or, or, or back or forth is a more flexible way of indicating that. That might That's be a useful thing to end up. Yeah, so we, we use like a, we have a status. So in 1DM, it would be a status quality that would be, they have an enumeration of live or deprecated or proposed, for example, it could be a life cycle. You could design a life cycle with some states and we use at smart things, we use proposed live and deprecated. And so a proposed capability is sort of while it's in staging and you know, even for a little while after, when we make sure it doesn't need any changes, then it goes live, and then it's stable, and then when we replace it, it it becomes eventually deprecated, and then it goes through that process of having both available. But they're just different names. But what an additional thing that you brought up is that we could, when we deprecate one, we could say replaced by. So like like with the ETF drafts, when you go on the draft system, it says that you can, it says, oh yeah, this, this, the name changed, but this replaces that draft, right? And so you could put a tag in the old, when you deprecate, you know, you could say 
sub whatever by I forget the word now, but um, you know, succeeded succeeded by or whatever. Um, um, supplanted is the only one I can think of, but you know, we could put a couple of qualities. We could add a couple of qualities that allow lifecycle management of the model instances themselves in the header. I mean, I, we don't have to design the whole thing here, but we could talk about different sort of well, the merits of different approaches. Yeah, I think it, it's really important that we spend some time thinking about the model metadata that go into that uh, header. So I think that this versioning feature uh, mechanism is, is just part of uh, uh, things that we want to be able to say about uh, models um, without actually changing the model itself, because the, yes. uh, the, the thing being modeled doesn't care about which version it was modeled with. Exactly. The model metadata is really what that is then, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's currently just mostly in the header. But I think if you could think about it as when you add a class, you're also changing the model metadata. So if we were to add a, an interface class to virtualize views of things, then that that's actually a change in model metadata and it adds qualities. And the set of qualities is also, I guess, model metadata, but specifically those things in the header tell you about the other things are sort of effects of the things. So, if, like, if you have a version that changes, that changes the, the feature set, and that's sort of the qualities and classes. So, right, I guess it, it does there, go back. There is, yeah. Mm -hmm. There is something interesting happening about evolution uh, here, because uh, in, in, in the ITF, we have this myth uh, that you can change everything in a document before it becomes approved. And th that's simply not true. So by by sitting there in in one form and being implemented uh, by people, uh, a revision or a version of a model acquires some weight, and you you never can get rid of that weight by by pointing to to any kind of the procedures and so on. The procedures just don't properly reflect what's going on in reality. Um, so um, in, in the ITF in particular, in, in the Yang world, they are trying to have this really well-defined transition uh, from a model that, that is still in draft stage uh, and a model that is finally published. And, and you can do certain things at draft stage and cannot do things once they are published and so on. And and I'm not sure that that this is not just uh, trying to to fantasize a reality that that, that never will exist uh, because people will be using draft versions of of something and will be building systems with them and uh, at some point you you need to decide um, whether you will be will want to accommodate uh, that reality or just just reacted but then then uh, rejected in a in a uh, well thought out well considered way we really want to get rid of uh, that that draft 15 version and we deprecate it and and uh, it, it's now gone um, so I think th that would be a nice thing if we could crack that uh, particular nut and and find a good way uh, to handle uh, version uh, transitions that, that actually uh, um, reflects the fact that versions exist in drafts and uh, uh, people sometimes go ahead and implement those drafts. Oh, we, we see so much of that <clears throat> in with IETF and even with things that aren't even adopted by IETF that people just published using the IETF system like JSON schema. For example, exactly. the issue of that right now. So um, I totally agree with you, and I think that um, I think that your sort of realistic and also sort of supply side solution proposal is the right direction. That there is a weight with evolution, 
and you can't make it go away. You can't even push it sideways very far. So it's gonna roll down the hill on the on the down the track. Um, so we need to deal with that in a way that's realistic, and we need to probably have rules that evolve as our designs evolve, and we recognize that things do become more stable, but not to give it such a binary character in our in our um, work process. <laughs> yeah, um, I totally. If we could figure out a better way of you know a way of you know, uh, just even improving how we deal with that. Yeah. Great discussion. Any more um, comments on versioning and evolution in general? Again, it feels like we're kind of grounded on, on, on a lot of this. So um, we need a I need for 1DM, we need a proposal. And I think the idea of tracking what's happening in lightweight M2M and tracking what's happening and sort of let's let's maybe use this as a forum for keeping this this versioning. And we already have, I guess, with you know, it's already a thing to thing topic. So um already have the right sort of um closure around, you know, maybe make let people know that we're working on it. And, uh one other thing I wanted to bring up actually. Um, in W3C, we've recently been discussing DIDs or yeah. identifiers. Yeah. Is it ever appropriate to use a DID to identify a version? Is <laughs> there, uh, if I wanted to create a DID method that's for versioning, like did version, maybe that I would. No, no, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just asking the question because uh, you, know, you just notice your ID numbers here. And yeah, I'm just talking about how DIDs work in general, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So having, you know, a... a so what is the you know reference that you use to refer to a particular version of something? Um, that's a URI. That's we're proposing yeah, so, to so use so a so URI. URI. That's right. And so DIDs are URI, so that's fine. Um, but I just don't know if any of the other stuff, like for example, um, do you ever need to have uh, you know encryption or certification or authentication that the version is an exact version you want? Um, is there any other reason for the other features of DIDs? So when if you need to validate that an instance is claiming to have an identifier and need to cryptographically verify that that's always an option but that's not really in the scope of what we're designing right or how does it how does it where's the yeah i'm also thinking of the container if it's container is certified you know like the data model has a has a has signed or something then you can handle things that way for, mm -hmm. for example if you list of prerequisites that a system needs and those things have versions but you sign the entire thing you necessarily have to sign the individual references. Um, I, I'm just bringing up the, I'm just yeah. doing it just now, and I'm just wondering if it, it matters at all. Maybe out of scope, which well, is fine. Like, if there's some coupling that we need to be aware of, then let's let's address it. But I'm, I'm not seeing it right now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I think that's again something that the framework should handle. Uh, if you if you do something with a device, then of course you. <clears throat> That whole chain of a hardware identifier that you put it up and you load your software correctly, that is signed, etc. So it, it ends up uh, that uh, you you have to do something correctly with your data models, but it should be part of that validation chain, not part yeah, of the okay. modeling language itself. And actually, just generalizing what you're saying, I think that versions are an example of I have certain prerequisites that have to be satisfied as we need to work, right? And so one of the things that have to be satisfied is having, you know, an interface of a certain version or whatever or better. Um, and so what I'm really doing is stating my requirements. And all the other requirements like root of trust may, may be related, um, but aren't exactly versions. There are other things you need to have satisfied, other conditions. The whole point is uh, if you're take uh, a deployment into account and you want to know uh, a version of a meta model that can be on the wire and if it's on the wire then it better be implemented correctly uh, and i think certification programs of uh, different organizations should be taking care of those kind of things well, actually, yeah, I was assuming that the, the existing methods for 
for cryptographically verifying instances of a file format like JSON signature would would cover you know that doing that in a in a framework oh. that you would get to check some you would essentially check some the 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 input you know you would be able to check some the reference model and cryptographically ver validate that well you know something I like that but I, I'm interesting word not... was brought up here just now with a certification which is basically you know uh, someone stating that yes this implementation satisfies this data model or whatever right. And so that's an example where you might have somebody signing something um, to, yes, to yes. certify something yeah, is yeah. in fact true. You do on your device, you you do you do certify that these tests have been done, and some of those tests do reflect back on validating that you've correctly implemented a data model. Yeah, but it, it's not it's not about the data modeling itself. It's the whole set of doing a device correctly with all the the feature that it belongs to. And that's that is way more than just implementing the model correctly. Right. Yeah, it, it, I do want to say in other standards groups are involved in like OpenGL, there's a big problem with people lying about their capabilities um, that a device would say it did something when in fact it did not or it hadn't actually passed testing. And this caused all kinds of problems. Um, you try and shame people. Yeah. Well, that's why you have a logoing program. So, yeah. uh, and uh, and you have to have well, it's extensive that you have what you have to do to have a certification program, and right. uh, and shouldn't be able allowed to lie. And if they do, you should be able to call them out. So, right. all the organizations that I've worked with that had a certification program, if you're putting that sticker on that you're certified. And you were not, then you can get a letter from the lawyers. Uh, that's strong. And if you're doing something that is not according to the spec and you had certified, but you launched a different version of your code, then you also can get a, a, an email from the lawyer. No. Uh, but that would be friendlier, but that would be fix it as soon as possible uh, kind of email. Right, but I think the letter from the lawyer implies that there's a, a contract or a logo program. Well, and, and that's actually the key. That's something that we haven't decided yet in, in one DM, you know, where we, what, what we're going to do about that and how we're, whether, whether and how. So that's an interesting topic, uh, probably to take <laughs> in another discussion, because it's probably not a research topic for thing to thing research group, but, but it is very interesting about, you know, when you do decide to certify something, then, you know, is there a cryptographic chain that you establish, et cetera, et cetera? Well, is that EF and W3C don't really have that infrastructure in place, those legal constraints, right? So they're more voluntary. You know, and, and so much turns around whether you do certification or not, as I'm finding out with getting involved in this new program in Zigbee. So um, I think that a big, there's a big dividing line on organizations that certify things and organizations that don't. And I think there's, there's um, a lot to be cognizant of and sort of what, what kind of one we're building. <laughs> well, I, I think there is a huge difference if you're doing things for IoT and that are working in a distributed way on the local network. Uh, or it goes to central uh, system. So um, when I was working with XMPP, I also said, why, why don't you have a certification program? And uh, the answer was pretty clear. Well, if you can't connect to the uh, XMPP server, <laughs> people will start using another client. That's called that's also, protocol versus that's platform. The, that's the, <clears throat> Well, it's not really a platform because uh, I think smart things can also be regarded as a platform, but it's yeah, it is it, it's not it's not in the same league. Because uh, if, if the XMPP client doesn't work, I will get another XMPP client, and that's the same thing in general with the internet. If my browser is not working, I will take another browser, and I guess everybody that's on the call has more than one browser on their system because. Some browsers are good at better, better, uh, good at things, 
and some are worse at better things. So you will take the ones that, for the task, you take the one that is most suitable. But that, that's not interoperability, but it is, uh, is one of the reasons why they can get away with a rigid, not having a rigid certification program. You're, you're relying that two devices that somebody is buying uh, suddenly uh, have to interact. Um, that, that's, that's a different ball game because the, then people will just throw those devices out if they don't work and people will not go back to that brand uh, because there is no update mechanism easily done. So I, I think that's why certification programs for Zigbee, OCF, uh, those kind of uh, UPMP, DLNA, those kind of things were pretty important, but it's not important for a browser. Yeah, yeah I, that's definitely. I guess we need to work work out what the coupling is because certainly the coupling we want our we want one dm to be used in those organizations that certify devices and the version the version coupling i think to get back to our topic is something that we uh we probably need to design appropriately right recognizing that our users are going to be certifying devices that use what we produce as input in one part of the process. Okay. Um, other comments on versioning? What you know, we followed the previous discussion on versioning with our discussion on versioning, but um, that doesn't mean we're going to go down the list in order. So I guess at this point, how close are we to the break? Mm, I'm check. Audit. Three minutes. Okay. Three minutes away, but it's so, <laughs> so this is a perfect let's, time. Let's organize the discussion, the next part of the discussion around which topics we want to prioritize on this list or add others or or whatever that does that, does that make sense for everybody? Okay. Um so the ones that we but yeah, go ahead. No, it just it sounds good. The ones that we <clears throat> in in one data model just a couple of hours ago, you know, we're interested in talking about are in bold here. So that was those are sort of our, our choices, and um, you know, it has to do with the class hierarchy thing. There was some, you know, well, you know who you, who you you know who you are with the issues, um, you know, things you want to do there. Complex data types. There's some question about it, a use case there that, um, having to do with um, what happens when you you really want to have a, a data type that has a lot of elements and, and maybe is hierarchical itself. How do we represent that and model it? Um, there's some interesting discussion around how we define events and actions and sort of a suggestion that we look at event condition action as being a framework for defining uh, what events and actions are and <clears throat> at least gives people some grounding in what they're for. <clears throat> there's some discussion about you know, uh, long running actions and how the state machine works and maybe we have events versus <clears throat> versus some read write status and, you know, how restful does that need to be? That's that's interesting. Um, instance bindings and protocol bindings. The question was sort of to what extent do we need to model the target architectures that are these one data models will be used on? So we're, we're talking about specifically the sort of thing that a W3C protocol binding does where it takes uh, a generic description and, you know, have some URIs and method, you know, method descriptions and things like that that says here's how you use a protocol. Instance bindings are just sort of, for those that, that aren't deep in 1DM, 1DM doesn't really have data schemas that says this is what it looks like over the wire even. It basically just tries to define things more generically, which is how we get the event, uh, the issue of complex data types. But nonetheless, we, we just try to say <clears throat> um, very, very generic, um, you know, this, this interaction has these data elements. And then we rely on another descriptor in the ecosystem eco protocol to say what this data schema looks like on the wire and what protocol elements are used. But that's kind of a fuzzy boundary because we do have things in one data model that can describe data schemas to the extent that 
you could just use them as payload schemas if you wanted to. So um, th that's an interesting discussion. And then these these other ones, um, you know, multiple instances of a definition, virtualization, um, have to do with you know how you <clears throat> how you have a generic definition that can be expanded and and sort of implemented in a number of different ways. Um, read write constraints about how restrictive you want to be with the definitions and, and is there really any data that's inherently write read only uh, stuff like that <clears throat> how you handle reusability with defaults there's some questions about uh, id numbers that are used to have compact wire representations for different protocols but they're used differently and how do we represent them and uh, so on and so forth there's i think some of these at the end are like uh, enum URI using a URI to define values of an enum and then having them map to different serializations. How would we handle that? And how do we handle namespaces? So these these are all topics that um, that are sort of on the big list of things to refine for for SDF. They don't all have to be done for the first version, but we do need to prioritize what we are going to do. And we have ways we're doing all this stuff now. And so a lot of these are sort of enhancements on the language that we can decide, you know, what the merit is of, of when we need them and if we need them, et cetera. So if anyone has any <clears throat> um, strong I ideas, uh, I, I think I've just briefly explained what, what each of these is. So we can, uh, we can sort of, after the break, uh, come up with some priorities of, of what we want to discuss for the second half. Sound good? Yeah, I think that uh, we really should focus on the uh, interaction patterns. So somebody brought um, up event condition action. Yeah. Which is a triple of words that use the same English words as the terms event and action in 1DM. But there's no, no relationship whatsoever otherwise. That's really interesting. Yeah. And also the 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 definition of what an action actually is uh, would be interesting. I wouldn't even start thinking about what an event is because we are so far away from a common understanding, but maybe we could make some progress on action uh, here uh, today. So I, I really would like to get some focus on that. And um, if we have some time left, at the end, we might want to talk about uh, complex uh, data types, but but really, let's talk about interaction patterns, and and the in particular the action uh, uh, pattern uh, for most of the time, and then maybe complex data types after that. I propose we make a ten minute break now, um, and uh, reconvene at ten forty five Pacific. Okay, sounds good to me. Thank you, everyone. Oh. Talk to you soon. Hey. Thank you, everyone. Um, we'll continue from here uh, in 10 minutes. Meanwhile, you can also think about if you have some additional uh, points on the uh, which, which of these items you would like like to prioritize, and then we'll we'll take it from there. By the way, for, for everyone, um, if you at any moment find it hard to jump into the discussion, uh, feel free to um, put your question in the chat room or you can put their Q plus, uh, like I just wrote down there. That will indicate for us chairs that you, you would like to talk in the queue. But otherwise, since we are still a relatively small group, um, you can also feel free and chime in if there's a break in the discussion. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, so soon, 10.45 Pacific time, we're going to be starting in less than a minute. So everyone finds their way back from the break. Um, Michael and Karsten, are, are you here? Poster, can you hear us? I can hear you, Ari. So the system is still up and running. Okay, well, that's a good sign. Thanks, Walter. I guess we're going to need Michael Coster to come back for the continuity segment. Anyone else, uh, any more reflections on what would you like to prioritize um, for the remaining key issues? Sorry, I mislaid my microphone. <laughs> this is one of these small lavaliers that you can clip at anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess. All, all the meetings we will uh, start and also during the break have a few minutes of <laughs> getting audio back and up and running. I see my coaster is at least sharing the screen. We, we don't hear you yet, though. I, I was just on mute. I I, uh, I saw that I needed to yeah, reshare the screen. And so I'm ready to go again. So before the break, we did discuss that we could uh, prioritize the interaction patterns on, on, on the next next topic. And um, we originally were planning to continue this until 11.20 uh, Pacific. So that would be about half an hour more. Okay. Um, but we we can see we can maybe also shrink a bit the final two slots. Um, we even maybe necessarily need half an hour for the IT standardization considerations. But let let let's see how this goes and um, how much how, how much over time we we shall, we shall take it. Well, I, I think we, the prior... we start with. In... Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was saying, I think I was just going to jump in. I, I think the priorities are good because what, what it, what we really need to do is make sure that we have, um, an architecture that makes sense. And I think the items that we've, uh, <clears throat> that we've, um, prioritized are those that, that sort of have a bearing on the architecture and what, you know, the, uh, the actual concepts that are being represented, et cetera, in the model. And the rest of these are, are more, you know, how do we, you know, more, more language issues, which we, we need to take up as well, but I, I kind of agree with prioritizing the architecture. So um, did anyone have any other ideas on things they wanted to prioritize? I guess maybe you asked that just before I sat down. Uh, yeah, I did maybe be first person who coming back from the, from the break, so there was no comments. Another 
I guess if there are no other comments, we can get started with that one. Go ahead. Okay. So um, <clears throat> just to get everyone to the same place, the there the the, the uh, there's a sort of UML diagram for the meta model, and we have events, actions, and properties that are uh, composed into reusable objects. And the events, actions, and properties share reusable data types. Um, and I guess that probably the best example is if I might have a state property on off and uh, you know an on off state property that's a Boolean. I might have an action that takes uh, that that's a setter for that that takes the same data type as the payload, and I might have an event that gets generated when the property value changes that sends the same data type as a payload. So that's the idea of a reusable data type. So um, and this is sort of our our whole mm, UML diagram. Ontology, you might call it, but it's really pretty simple. But this is this is our meta model for for one data model. And so, what what we I think where the discussion starts is sort of we have events, actions, and properties. Okay, and and, and the the current working definition is pretty loose. It says that properties represent the states of things and they're generally readable and writable but there's another issue there's another item on this list that has to do with you know what if you only have pub sub and so <laughs> properties may not always even be readable and writable depending on the, the binding but nonetheless you have properties that represent state and they're generally accessible in some way and settable in in, in some other way and some, sometimes they're settable they're not settable through the application and the read only or whatever, but those are properties. Actions are sort of the way we represent commands, typically commands that you send. So they're, they're a little more complex than just changing the state of a property. They may have to do with changing the state of multiple properties together. They may have to do with starting something on a device that might take some time to complete and it might complete correctly or it might not complete correctly. So actions are more about how do I get this, this, the affordance for how do I get this, you know, to perform something? And uh, events are, uh, the typical defini definition of event is a, a happening. Something happens on the device or, and so the event is the affordance by which I learn about things that happen on the device. And so an event is a class of definition and wh when we make a definition for these things like in in one data model the um maybe maybe you have some examples but let me know if you need extra examples but any in a property definition basically is sort of like a data type definition and that's the most recognizable thing and, and i think as we said earlier no one has a problem understanding what properties are and how they work it's sort of like a data definition it, it you know, it, it has a type like number or string or Boolean, or it might have some extended typing like you went eight or float or something like that. And it, and what we do though in, in, in one data model is we create a semantic anchor for the definition of a property that, that sort of becomes part of one of these objects that, that's also a higher level definition that's reusable. And so the properties look like data definitions and the data within a property, the data that a property carries is also reusable, those data types. So for example, a temperature property carries a temperature data type and that temperature data type is defined as having, you know, a set of permissible units like Fahrenheit, Celsius, Kelvin, Rankin, and maybe some, maybe some others if you're, depending on what your domain is. Um, but so properties are really well known and, and but events and actions are not quite so well defined. So what we say an action is, is, is as I said, something that something that you make this this an affordance for making your device or the thing your device is connected to you know, perform something. And so the definition of an action has a semantic anchor for what the action is. And, the, and as for example, a, <clears throat> a light bulb might have a turn on action and a turn off action, or a, a you know. 
dim the light or brighten the light or something like that, that, that have more than just changing the value of a brightness. There might be a time uh, slope involved, a um, transition time or other, other kinds of things involved with it. And when we define an action, it's really the semantic anchor of what the action is and its input parameters and perhaps its output parameters as well. So like we said, sometimes you can invoke an action and then get some response back that tells you, um, <clears throat> you know, whether the action is done or whether it's going to be deferred or, you know, like, those are all things that we need to model because different devices and different ecosystems handle these things in different ways. So really what we're doing is we're not so much trying to, from first principles, to decide what the meaning of an action is what we already have meaning because we have these devices like Zigbee devices that have commands and V-Wave devices that have commands and UPnP devices that have actions. And those definitions are already pretty consistent about what those mean. So we just decided to call that an action. Events are a little pretty much the same thing rather than try to really define from first principles the semantics of what we mean by event, but we already have examples of UPnP having events, of, 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 of Zigbee devices sending notifications when property values change. And so those all fall under what we, what we call events, and they're defined in one data model as having a semantic anchor for what this semantic definition of this event is, like it might be just a general device alarm, something's wrong. It might be something very specific, like an over temperature or over current event. And we don't really try to say that because existing devices and existing, um, you know, uh, infrastructure is already modeled, is already defined, and we just need to figure out how to model it. So, <clears throat> you know, that's sort of the, the background on what we mean by events and actions in one data model. And then uh, this morning we had this discussion around event condition action pattern. And I was <laughs> quick to point out, maybe, maybe this would be a good way to start the discussion, that really the way we use events and actions in IoT applications is closely related to the event condition action pattern because we have something that happens. We have a rule that evaluates it, and then an action that's generated to, to take place. So, for example, in our Smart Things platform, we have the events coming in from devices, and you know, the motion is being sensed in your living room, or you know, someone turned the light off in the kitchen. And um, there are rules that we set up and behaviors that we set up to respond to these events, and they generate commands to, oh, when this happens, do this, do this other thing. So, to me, that's a the way that events and actions on IoT devices that we're talking about are used is in, in a pattern that's very similar to event condition action. So with that, I you know, open up the discussion. So this is Hank. I brought this up because um, we, uh, um, again, we, we try to uh, incubate something like that with a uh, Yang automation framework in IETF like two years ago. Uh, in the context of Yang Push, then there was a big uphaul, and some of the uh, offers uh, just went away. And now there is an, it's a, it's a, uh, so it's a sibling uh, effort uh, in uh, in NetMod about the uh, ECA framework and the very basics in, in the management uh, domain and ops in, in ITF. So so there is uh, there are other places where this formalization is uh, being adopted and done, and I think that is good because the more people do it. The better it is understood, and the better it is understood how conditions and actions actually relate, and how, for example, an action could be another event emission and such. So maybe an action is creating a new event, and so on. Have this change, and uh, yeah. So we do, we are not doing this alone. If if you would adopt that model at some point, and that is actually I think a good good start. Yeah. The the other observation that I made now. I guess to back up a little bit, I'm not deeply aware of any formal event condition action framework. So there may be some internet drafts or other, you know, sort of formal writing. I'm 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 sort of aware more of a general design pattern. So I, I guess I'm speaking more of the general design pattern, but it seems also 
that we have a lot of um, interest in this group defining more than just events, actions, and properties, but also defining in a way that's reusable and interoperable, you know, with, you know has all the qualities of the other work we do, um, to define things uh, like the context of devices, so, you know, um, machine parts or locations or whatever, and also to define behaviors, and, and behavior meaning essentially um, things like uh, rules and scenes, you know, if I want to group a bunch of actions together and call them a scene and perform all these actions and set all these property values when, you know, as part of this scene, for example, for home automation. And, and scenes are actually used in, beyond home automation. They're used in commercial lighting and really a lot of a lot of other places. And so there's a lot of interest in our modeling being extended to go beyond just events, actions, and properties of devices and those affordances that they impart to the things that they're bolted onto, but also the the software orchestrations and um, other sort of context that goes with them. So in in a way, I was interested in, and also this idea of event condition action being something that we could you know, anchor on as, as far as how we define rules and things like that. I don't know, though. I, I don't know. Again, is there a is there already a, a well known sort of framework that has very narrow definitions for event condition and action that, that we need to sort of take into account here? Or is it a, the general pattern that you're talking about? Um, I would not call it well known because it is now rekindled in you, but it is narrow in, in scope. Because uh, the, the, the explosion in complexity can be vast, yeah, uh, especially with the conditions in view. Um, so uh, it should be basic and it should be uh, simple to interpret by every data model or representable by every data model. That is one of the um, uh, goals here, I think. And to my, um, uh, yeah, from the top of my head, I cannot remember the name of the draft, but I will post it to chat in the next minutes. Okay, well, it, it may be that it may be that we need to understand how our definitions of events and actions relate to what's being defined there. But I think our, our job is to really say, are we happy with our definition of what we mean by event and what we mean by action? And what do we need to improve that or, or change it as needed? I see there's a question on the queue. Point out that this is really a fallacy of, of using the same terms for some completely different things. Mm -hmm. um, so, event condition action systems are uh, the subset of rule systems. You may know about, uh, don't know how to pronounce this in, in English, RETA systems. Uh, these are really the, the most powerful ones. And um, in a rule system, you describe the behavior within one system. So if an event happens in one system, uh, you look at a condition and then when the, the event has happened and the condition is fulfilled, you perform some action. Uh, but this is completely unrelated to the issue we have here, uh, which is uh, where we define interaction patterns uh, called uh, properties, events, and actions. And these are always between two systems. Uh, so you might mix those. So you might use an incoming event as a trigger to evaluate a condition and send an action back to a device. But th that's, that's completely outside the scope of, of a data model describing the interaction because the, the whole ECA stuff is happening locally on one system. And yes, we may want to, to have a language for describing these things and so on, and mobile code and, and lots of beautiful things can be done there, but it's just something completely different. Um, so the, the interesting thing, if you look at the, the data modeling aspect of these things, is that an event looks exactly like a property uh, because both just have one data type, uh, which des defines uh, what what the thing looks like at the moment when when it's actually interchanged. 
so from a data modeling point of view, events and, and uh, uh, properties are identical. And uh, you can see that by, by the fact that uh, we, we have frameworks like Quad N uh, where, where we have notifications, which some th people think are aspects of properties. The property tells you when it has changed and other people things are aspects of events. Um, and you really have to look at the details of, of those interaction patterns to find out uh, what, what are the actual semantics. So th there is a very, very, very big difference between a temperature sensor telling me, oh, the temperature is now uh, 80, 31 degrees and the temperature is now 32 degrees and so on. That's a very different uh, thing from um, a, a coin checking device that is telling me somebody put in a coin and, and somebody put in another coin. In, in one case, you could just lose one of these events and the other event would still mean exactly the same thing. In the other case, uh, it's really, really important to not lose those events. So th they are semantically very, very different. And th the question in an interaction pattern always is beyond the data model. Uh, what does it actually mean for the thing to actually happen, to, to actually be triggered uh, and so on. So the, the, the event itself, and, and now I'm using the term event in, in the computer science sense, um, is of interest. So the, 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 there are event triggered and level triggered uh, 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 concepts in, in electrical engineering, which also have this, this interesting uh, uh, dichotomy. Uh, so uh, I think ECA is not, not going to lead us anywhere here, except that at some point it would be nice if we could feed the events that are, we are modeling here uh, into an ECA pattern and, and use the same description technique and then on the other uh, end get out actions. And by the way, actions ha also have these interesting uh, dichotomy between uh, being non-losable, uh, somebody put in payment of, of uh, uh, Twenty dollars. Now, what what's the the uh, total paid amount? That would be an action uh, of of the the non losable way, and the other one would be set the the set point of the thermostat to thirty two degrees, uh, where the the actual action is uh, unimportant. Um, so I think we have to look at the the details here, and not let ourselves uh, being misled. By, by the, the beautiful thing that, that people only seem to know three words for these things, which, which are pre, uh, properties, events, and actions, uh, but they, they all mean different things each time they use them. Yeah, I, and really that was the point I was trying to make to say that in our model, we mainly only describe the input and output data for events and actions, and we don't really dis describe much about what that does. So in many cases, especially when the two special cases that you brought up, and I'm only seeing four cases, I'm sure it could be more, but there's satyrs, which is a, what we call an action, but it's really a satyr. And we call it an action because, probably because we're trying to map a lot of other device ecosystems and models that have already called setters actions, including smart things, including UPnP. And the other thing is a state change event, and which which could be a change of an enum value or a change of a scalar value, um, and Boolean being an enum. And and so that it looks just like a property. So then but, but we have these other things that are also called actions and events, and just to broadly classify them, what's not a setter is an action is something that you, that has multiple values and has uh, maybe a long running status and has these extra things that you can't model with the property. So in a way, again, it, it's sort of about having to map stuff that already exists versus being able to create a you know, a correct definition. We, I guess we have to figure out how to reconcile that. So, the, and, and then the, similarly for events, you have things that aren't just state changes of properties, they're genuine happenings. And as you say, they have qualities where you probably can't just arbitrarily miss one and lose one out of the stream. 
there's state changes in a state machine, whereas if you miss one, you don't end up in the same state. And actions are, I think this, I think it's a very good point that that some actions are just setters and they they're idempotent and they don't have that property. And other actions do have that property that if you miss an action, you don't end up in the same state. And the in, the intended result is not what was expected. And I think this is all an artifact of what happens between two systems. And I, so I think that's a, a correct framing, also an important framing, I should say. Um, and I also agree that ECA, and I think it was really what I was trying to get at is maybe ECA isn't helpful in defining what we're doing other than as a use case, but it, it, it is sort of a use case in that I agree that it's helpful if we can define what happens between events and actions in a, in a system as in some commonality with the ECA framework. So I think the, the interesting part of this discussion is what do we need to do about reconciling actions that aren't setters and events that aren't property changes? And whether those need different classes or whether, because modeling them on existing ecosystems tends to sort of squash those definitions. What, what do we do about that? What do we need to do and what, you know, what should we do? And first, was that, was that like a reasonable framing or, or follow on? So in, in CDP, they, they have uh, used uh, the item potent uh, property a lot. I cannot just say property here. Um, quality in 1DM. Yeah. Sorry? We, we, we would call that a quality in 1DM, but it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's also well, an attribute of. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Uh, so something is item potent or it's not, and they also have this uh, idea of something being unsafe, uh, which is really about uh, when 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 you do it, it means something, and when you do it twice, it it uh, might mean the same thing or a different thing. But it, it the fact that you did it means something. Um, so I think th these uh, these are actually two dimensions. We probably need a couple more dimensions, and then we can put the the various usages of event action and property uh, into this this uh, uh, two, three, four dimensional system and and be much more precise than we are at the moment. One way to um, model that, <laughs> one way to accomplish that in, in, in our 1DM framework as it is, if we wanted to look at just having events, actions, and properties, is we could uh, have some kind of um, additional descriptors for events and actions that describe these things like item potency and safety and things, uh, things like that. Um, uh, but it also seems like <clears throat> uh, a model could, could simply model properties and have these additional frameworks as like protocol bindings. <laughs> it's it's really going to another level of um, um, you know austerity in the modeling. But if you if you you know the core, right? It's saying okay, every we're already modeling events and actions essentially as data types that have these additional semantic sort of hooks that give them additional meta meta operations. Like for example, actions are things that have multiple data items, you can invoke them and there's possibly a long running status, but we're really just still in, we're still modeling the data, but we're also saying that there's a, a state machine semantic around it. Likewise with events, we're still modeling the data, but we're implying a, a, a kind of an interaction state machine with events. With properties, we're implying an interaction state machine that's not always there. It's read and write. And, and you know, I guess another one of my points here is that often you have publish and subscribe and you don't even have read and write. On, on the protocol, you have a, a sort of, you upload all the state and then you send incremental changes and the read and write only happens at the, you know, digital twin or shadow or whatever you want to call it. That's that's somewhere else and not it's on the other side of the, it's the other system, right? <laughs> So when we describe interactions between two systems, we don't always even have 
read and write. So there's, there's a bunch of things, but it, you know, again, mapping onto these existing systems, actions and events make sense because they're classes of things that already exist that seem to <clears throat> seem to line up semantically. So what would, you know, what kind of, what kind of approach would make sense? Would it, would it make sense to just add things to actions and events to further describe them? That, that seems to me to be a, a forward approach forward, but, but also keeps this notion of actions and events. As opposed to having only properties that have different ways of interacting on them as another layer. Which actually seems like an alternative model now that I think about it. But we still need the, the distinction between something having input and output data and uh, which are different in, in semantics and uh, something that, that uh, may have input data or output data or both, but they, they really mean the same thing. Um, so a property is, is of the second kind and uh, the, the kind of event that you have been talking about partially is, is that as well. Uh, but uh, the difference here really is in the initiative. Uh, a property is, is always uh, uh, examined from, from the other side while an event is uh, triggered by, by the side that, that has this. Um, so I think th these are again two, two different uh, uh, dimensions and, and we might be able to keep those terms because people love them so much, uh, but we really should nail them down to, to be one interaction pattern and, and not, not a list of, of different interaction patterns. So in, <clears throat> in thinking of the boundary between two systems, and you could even think of a single system that has a boundary like this, what we have are, and, and to just restate what you just said, we have properties that are examined from the other side. I, I like that because it doesn't really say how they got there. Events and actions, though, do say something about the system boundary, and it says that actions are things that go from the, the right-hand side to the left-hand side, if, if you follow what I mean, that they go from the the operating operation side, operator to the operate. Oh, let me just say that. <laughs> I don't even know what what the terms are, but actions go one direction to the device from the controller. I would call it a controller if I was in an industrial control system. And events go from the device back up to the controller. So actions go from the controller to the device from one system to another, if you split it that way. And the events go from the device to the controller. So is that, and so that's really the only thing that we say about them now. We say that properties are things that you can examine, actions are things that are transmitted, and we, we could also say asynchronously, in a way, uh, on demand or whatever, from the controller to the device. And events are things that are usually transmitted asynchronously, although we could think about them being batched and we could think about different methods of obtaining them. They're, they're happenings that, have sequence dependencies and and I guess you'd have to say a little bit more about the semantics of events and around sequence dependencies, but then some of them don't. So if we only say that they're things that are transmitted from the device to the controller, and then we further characterize them in the in the model as being having these qualities of item item potency, safety, maybe we we have to identify some some things for events that say whether they're property state changes or or happenings, you know, whether they're serializable or mm, I want to say monotonic or, you know, we, we come up with a concept like that that represents that you can't drop them, for example. Right. Well, so I, I think I go back to the proposal or <laughs> if I was going to make a proposal, I would say, let's keep actions and events because, as you say, people love them and they kind of understand that it it has a directional meaning and it as an asynchronous kind of connotation, but we provide enough descriptors to really, in the model, nail down what they do. Right. So, for instance, in in um, actions, we have 
uh, confirmable actions, so actions that actually give you something back at the end, and we have non-confirmable actions. And of course, you can use a pair of a non-confirmable action and an event uh, to model a confirmable action. So the, the only thing that the confirmable action brings to the table is that it has an implicit a uh, connection between the, the invocation and, and the uh, return value, which you would need to model explicitly when you uh, compose a non-confirmable action and an event. An event, yeah. And I, I think we just need to write this up and, and actually look at all the cases, including quad N notifications and so on, uh, and, and see how do they fit uh, into this, and then we will maybe have three things, uh, three bits uh, we can set or not set, and we will have defined anything, and then we can just go ahead and say, oh, those combinations are events, and those combinations are actions, and those are properties, but this is just sugar on the, the real semantics, which is based on which of the, the bits is on and which one is not. And, and also the notions of input data and output data, I think, <laughs> along with that, right? Yes. That's interesting. Um, that's, yeah, I think it feels like we could do that, but it also feels like we need to now go and think about, <clears throat> you know, some examples. And like you say, does it, does it, does it really, the, the win here is if it can describe cred n without having to add <laughs> actions and properties. I'm sorry, actions and events because they don't exist in crud -N. I'm not saying that's always how it should be done. It could be that we always want to model things that are called actions and events, but the mapping onto crud -N could be done without a lot of gyrations potentially. Although you still have to say how you send multiple things and you know they may be a different URI. There's still a mapping task to do where something, the system that was designed as, as a REST or restful interactions from the beginning may not have, you know, things that are easily, well, I don't know, they have notifications of things. It's just, it's just the mapping task. Well, notifications don't really work very well in, in REST. So people just glue something on top of REST. Uh, but actions actually exist. The, the, the post yeah. pattern, of course, is, is the classical way to do an action. Right, and it, it, it has these, yeah, right, it's, and it has these attributes of that impotency and safety and um, confirmability and and all of those can be layered on it without breaking the semantics of post. Well, uh, just looking at how UPMP works, that's just uh, an action pattern, just using SOAP. And for eventing, uh, you have to have also on the other side as a client, you have to have a server to receive events. And uh, that's what they call GINA, generic event notification something. And, if that's, using... just, and that's just working uh, uh, already for many, many years. <laughs> so, um, so that church can't do. Um, uh, action is just, yeah, I don't think that's true. It's just, uh, you have to build something on top of it to make it easier for you, like SOAP did and what Gina did. And of course, if you do it using something like CoAP, then you could use uh, the observe mechanism to get updates um, on it, on a resource. It doesn't require a server which technically doesn't require a server because it's just a, a, a long response. No, uh, actually, if you just look at CoAP, uh, CoAP works because they have on both sides always a, and a server because it's UDP. Right, but if, if you just wanted notifications, you don't need a server. The client accepts the response as, oh. The, the the thing is you you're soliciting that the server sends something back to you and that means that either you have a have to have an open connection or you have to have a server to make that connection to to deliver that message 
So um, yeah. and basically, I don't care what you do. So if you open a web socket, which is also uh, plenty, I've seen plenty implementations that just uses a web socket for receiving events because they yeah, have just a pipe. Yeah, yeah, you have a pipe where you where you can dump that information upon. So, um, and this goes right back to what you said earlier. It's like that <clears throat> there's this, this um, I forget what you called it, but like basically a layer, a transport layer is really what it is, or transfer layer where you decide how this stuff gets moved. But the modeling itself on the data and the qualities of data don't need to be tightly bound to any particular transport operation. So if we can define Data that's idempotent and has idempotency quality, a certain safety, it's confirmable, whatever. You can send that as a post and call that an action. And that's what we would do in the modeling because that's what everyone's familiar with. Likewise, for events, we'd come up with data that has particular qualities like serializable and monotonic and, you know, whatever. And we could define some levels of strictness or whatever sort of like uh, cons consistency. Oh, sorry, coherence protocols. And, you know, and maybe even have, you know, also, you know, serializable being like, um, you know, that definition, right? So we could have different qualities of data that he could even define serializable locks if we wanted. And then those operations though, whether you do test and set on them or whether, you know, what you do is part of the protocol binding. So if we could move it more toward that, and certainly events are always, you know, into certain bindings like PubSub and, you know, you'll always have that. But we should, you know, what I'm learning, especially with looking at industrial controls and field buses and how they work and how cloud to cloud APIs work differently from local LAN APIs, even when implementing similar REST dish protocols. This, the, 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 the more we can abstract these, uh, how we define things in the model, the, the better it is to, to mapping to these different ecosystems. Because the data model is going to be the same, the definitions as we, you know, from from the terms from the two system perspective, a let's call it a client is going to see properties as things that it can. Um, I forget the word Karsten used, but it was really good. But things that you can I think I know. <laughs> things that you can you know you can have locally, um, and interact with locally. And cache them and stuff like that. Events are things that you receive that sort of happen asynchronously that tell you about happenings that have to be delivered in order and all of that. And then actions are things that you you send that are that non-local that have uh, they're not safe. Maybe they have side effects. They might just be setters and they might have item. They might be an item potent and safe and non-confirmable. And they might look just like properties and that you would call that a setter, but you could still model it as an action in the model. And it seems like that's kind of the direction that um, in terms of a practical direction that we, we could head to uh, really reconcile all of this stuff. And, you know, putting, putting tags, putting, putting them into classes in the model, like action and event, um, provides a default sort of mapping to different transfer layers that that kind of helps, I guess, the developers and humans keep track of things also, I think. Designers, if you will. Anyway, I'm like talking a lot. Um, what do other people think about this? One comment on the the action part is that how I've seen it commonly described compared to a, a property is that when you invoke an action, you would get a, a handle that then you can inspect what is the state of the action, maybe cancel the action, you know, and then or, or get, get more information about what's going on with the action. Whereas property it's simply get set and, and, and you're done with it. Yeah, that, that's yeah, so. kind of action, but there are also things like um, uh, asking a device that has a probe uh, to actually activate that probe and answer back whether the probe hit anything or not. Uh, so th that's not, 
you don't need a, a pointer for the ongo ongoing action. You're just starting something that has an inference on the physical world and want the result from that operation. Well, that, that's a, also called an action. There is a time aspect. And, and uh, if you already know what you're doing, modeling wise can take a, a long time. And you can model it already in a way that that time aspect is being um, handled correctly by the model. So it, the action returns uh, and uh, you get indeed information uh, where you can access the, the, inf uh, the time aspects, duration, uh, progress, whatever on, on, that, uh, on that action. This is this is just a normal pattern, and that has basically nothing to do uh, with the action pattern itself. It's just uh, a, again a pattern on top of the the action pattern. Yeah, you'd call it like sequence clock or something like that, where you'd get multiple um, output data elements that that had some element of timing and sequence associated with them. And then, yeah, you know, I, that's that's kind of the idea that we we define an action as an action in the model semantically, but we also define its input data and output data as having the qualities that we we need to make it work right. So the if it's if it's input only, um, then well, that, that's why I think an action should just be something similar like a soap call. You, you define what the input parameters are and you define what the output parameters are. Basically just a C, a C function. So you define your inputs and you define what is being returned by the function, by the, yes. either by, by the argument list or by the, the return clause of a C function. Yeah, I think that's what we do with actions today, more or less. We have input yes. data. Uh, that's, yeah. I, I just make it clear that I think that that should be the pattern. And what you oh, build, right. build on top of it is again uh, modeling, but it, it depends on what you want to model. And of yeah. course we can uh, prescribe a few patterns in how to do these models to make it more, to look that everything is more uniform, but basically, if something is different because the modeling should be different, I don't care too much. Mm -hmm. it, it should not affect the language. It should just affect the model. I think I follow that. I mean, I think you're really talking about the same thing here where well, if I if I just go back to my old days uh, when I was very very active in the UPMP forum, we had oh, state variables. With, <laughs> yeah, we had uh, we had state variables, which is like more or less like the ODM properties. You just have setters and getters on them, and then you have actions, uh, SOAP actions, which is the same thing as we are now defining with ODM actions. And you had events, and uh, and that's what we had to subscribe on it. But you just define uh, architecture. You just define what what kind of data it is, and also uh, when you would when it when it would be triggered by something else. And and that are the the I think the concept still that we also do in SDF which works pretty well. So I, I could map the whole, whole UPMP, all the, the architectures to SDF with, with not too much problems with it. And of course, you know, the, the UPMP architecture fills in a few blanks. Uh, that's what we want to do with SDF as well. And how you want to make that mapping, that, that's up to you. So if you just look, the UPMP spec. They don't talk about SOAP. They just talk about what's what are state variables and what are actions and what are the events. And the architecture documents uh, describes then how these are being put on the wire. 
And I, I think we are yeah. doing exactly the same. Yeah. It's, yeah. That is, that it's, is it's what, in my what, model. Yeah. And, you know, maybe even a little more abstraction, but that's, that is definitely the, the pattern. And, and I think the idea that having events, actions, and properties where we're describing just the data exchange and then, um, you know, not really, uh, by, by that I mean we aren't really specifying that you have to use a particular protocol. That, that really is in line with what you were just saying, that, um, that we know what actions are for, they're for creating side effects, typically. Um, and we know what events are for, and they're for observing um, happenings, you know, and then we have all these other qualities that even if even if you were to define events without, you know, even if they were sort of mm, tightly coupled to protocol artifacts, you'd still have to specify constraints on what those protocol artifacts did. So we might as well try to abstract them and specify them as data artifacts, even though they're pro protocol artifacts. But by, by that I mean an event isn't just a piece of data. It's understood to be a sequence of data items that have certain qualities of sequential, you know, consistency, if that's actually overloading of the wrong term, but sequentiality, monotonicity, order. So an event is known as a series of, of items, you know, an, an action is known as a thing that might have input and output data. But, but also, we have enough qualities on the, the basic data to, uh, to define them as data uh, qualities as well. Meaning that they, they go with this definition in my model, I'm modeling something where I'm getting data that has to be sequential. So I'm going to call it an event. Um, but presumably you could also call it a property and require it to be sequential. But that's, this is where I'm not sure whether we really want to do that or not. Um, right. So it could be a, uh, it could be like, Give me DDS protocol, where you have properties that come back as sequential, sequentially reported state changes, and you might define that as a QoS requirement in DDS, as that you can't lose data, so you require require that to be sequential, even though it's state changes. For example, I don't know to what extent we want to allow those other things to, you know, um, qual qual the other qualities to be applied, like. The sequential monotonic and ordered only apply to events or they just apply to any data in general. And you know, that 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 being said, <laughs> what if I want to sometimes temperature to be sequential and sometimes not? So, you know, is there a late binding option? So I guess there's some implementation questions about how we structure the model around it. And that's where Carson was saying we kind of need some, some examples and to see whether they to see whether they line up well with cred and mappings and stuff like that. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good way to summarize this. Like, um, we have very good points on all around what we actually mean by this, and getting uh, some examples and and working through those uh, to get a bit more clarity here. Because so I'm I'm looking at the clock now. Um, we have only about twenty minutes time of session. Okay. We have one more uh one more uh, aspect we want to cover uh, in this workshop. Um. Michael, do you want to some final summary on, on, on this plot? What should be our way forward for getting the more getting more clarity? So on the yeah, so, patterns. So to summarize, I think you you made a good start at a summary, and that is that um, we we recognize that um, that we're mostly describing data, and so what we want to do is describe the individual qualities of things that that how events and actions work, even to the extent that actions don't always work the same way. And we want to <clears throat> essentially use action and event mainly as semantic anchors that that come with a an assumed set of qualities. But we also want to have maybe we'll use maybe we'll build defaults in the model. Maybe we'll require some of them be uh, specified, but that's that's all implementation detail. But essentially, the, the takeaway here is that we want to define events and actions in the context of the qualities around the way that data are obtained and transmitted, but without mapping them to any particular protocol. So there are things like uh, item potent, safe, uh, confirmable, non confirmable, input, output, uh, sequential, monotonic, uh, 
you know, we, we need to come up with some words, but um, that's that's basically the flavor of it. That's that's the takeaway I have so far. Uh, so I think most of those things belong to architecture. We should not put that in the model. Model is just data and how it's being transferred, confirmable or non-confirmable, that depends on how you want to use it. And that's tied to the, arch the underlying architecture. I think that was probably the wrong, that's probably the wrong choice of confirmable and non-confirmable. But I think what I really meant by that was when I have an action, do I expect there to be a return to the action or is it more of a fire and forget? And I think we decided that that is, needs to be part of the model. Maybe not in all cases, maybe sometimes it needs to be constrained in the model and sometimes it needs to be left open to the implementation. But um, well, if, if you, if you don't model return values, then it's a fire. Uh, and that, yeah. that's still, uh, I think it should be confirmed. Uh, I agree. It's still confirmable, uh, but it still can be fire and forget. And, and if you then uh, also have defined an event uh, that uh, if something changes on the system, that that event will be sent. And uh, basically, you you got your fire and forget uh, and uh, return value by an event. Uh, those kind of things you can just model if you're just doing the standard eventing and soap uh, like actions. And you can also uh, create an action that immediately returns with data. That's also possible. And, and as we said, we can create an action that returns a point or two events that you can get to find out about the action or returns events right in the channel that you invoke. Yes, yeah. so if, if, you, if you can get- Using WebSockets uh, or something like that, you could get the events right back in the same channel. Sure. So what we want to do though in the modeling is avoid saying, uh, to, to, we want to be able to create a generic <clears throat> model that doesn't depend on any particular mechanism, but allows all those mechanisms and provides some application interoperability at the end point. So it's the extent at which we can separate the data qualities and the information model from the interaction model is probably the interaction model, meaning that the, the protocol the, the bus protocol or the network protocol interaction model, right? So we want to describe the, the data interaction model in terms of, you know, events and actions and the way that those qualities, but we want to abstract it from the network interaction model of get, put, post, delete, publish, subscribe, you know, send, receive, or whatever they are. Okay. I think we have now a good set of material to work on this uh, on, on, the, on the 1DM side. So we really need to move to the next segment now. Okay. Th that, thanks, thanks a lot, guys. Good, yeah, good discussion. Yeah, we still have another topic, but, uh, but that was, I think we, we covered the one that really made the most impact. So thank you again. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. With, with that, Karsten, would you like to take a lead on the last segment? <clears throat> yeah. So, um, I propose to to quickly look at uh, what the the procedural uh, steps are to move the specification forward. So we have talked about technical issues uh, for most of the meeting, but I think it, it makes sense to think about. Uh, what we need to do on, on the side of organizing uh, things. And in previous 1DM meetings, there was um, some sentiment that, that the ITF might actually be a good place to uh, finish, uh, to complete the SDF uh, specification that we have been uh, talking about uh, today. And uh, <clears throat> there, there are good reasons for that. There, there are also reasons against that. So I, I think it's not not a complete slam dunk that that of course we want to do that. Uh, we have to think about that. Uh, so on on the plus side, we have uh, <clears throat> aspects uh, like uh, well-defined process for for turning out uh, specifications, 
and a well-defined way to engage the community. So a lot of the questions that would have to be answered within 1DM, how to handle the process, already are answered in the IETF. We could just use that process. Also, there, there is an established review process that, that is exceptionally thorough and, and generally provides a, a significant quality improvement. And I'm saying that at, at, uh, as an author that, that has been on the receiving end of that quality improvement uh, quite a few times. So it's sometimes a little bit uh, hard to, to bear, but you have to bear it. If, if you want to create something high quality, you need some, some pushback on things that uh, maybe weren't so good. And uh, uh, the third thing, because people know that this review process uh, happens in the IETF, uh, th there is generally a good reputation of, of uh, the documents that come out uh, of the IETF, the, the Senate track uh, RFCs. So these are all good reasons why choosing the IETF uh, would make a lot of sense. Um, on the other side, um, th there are a few things that, that we have to think about. And one thing is that the IETF is not exactly the, the leading organization in defining modeling uh, languages. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, typically modeling languages are defined by, by ISO in the same uh, space in which, for instance, programming languages are also uh, defined. Uh, there are things like UML and so on. Um, and uh, the, for, for document modeling languages, also W3C is a, a, a well-known organization. So ITF is a little bit of an outlier here. On the other hand, it has happened. Uh, so for instance, uh, ITF has its uh, own specification for uh, uh, syntax uh, for, for modeling uh, text-based. Uh, um, protocols called ABNF. IETF has recently done CDDL for modeling JSON and, and uh, CBOR uh, data. So it's not like this has never happened, but it's also not like all the community that's interested in standardizing modeling languages is already sitting in the room when we start that work. So we, we, we still have to attract uh, some of those people. The second thing that we have to be uh, aware of is that starting work in the IETF is a relatively arduous process and um, it also somewhat risky. So you, you don't always get the result that would be logical uh, from your point of view. Uh, so uh, yeah, it, it's a little bit of a game. So uh, usually it works. Uh, but it also can turn out to be a detour at the end that, that doesn't lead to a result and that might cost us some time. And uh, the third thing is that thorough process I referred to above, that just takes some time. So if, if we just want to do some rubber stamping on something we already agree is the right way to do things, uh, we might go to Oasis or one of these other uh, organizations that, that do rubber stamping. ECMA, um, what else do we have? ISO, um, they, they're usually good for getting things uh, rubber stamp. So um, you can guess what my conclusion after thinking about all of these things uh, is, uh, but I, I wanted to, to uh, make you aware uh, of uh, these considerations. So the, the next step we, we probably have to answer is what is it actually that we want to standardize? And uh, clearly we want to standardize SDF, the language, and th there, there are several aspects to it. And one is of course the structure. So, so people who are doing, defining this language, uh, think about uh, the language as defined by a schema, which I, I think I have, pointed out is not all, is not the whole story. Um, there are of course semantics. And I think ultimately we have to be able to explain our processing models. So how, how are models that are written in SDF uh, actually uh, used? 
And uh, I, I don't want to start this discussion today, but uh, I think we need to keep in mind uh, that we have to define this processing model at least to the level so we can actually define meaningful semantics. So that, that's one thing. And then, of course, there is also the, the data validation aspect, and that's currently done by JSON schema org uh, in, in SDF. And we would have to uh, think about good ways to, to uh, put these parts together. Uh, so, of course, one, one uh, way forward would be to convince the ITF that the JSON schema org stuff uh, should be standardized. Uh, that has not happened yet so far, but th there are people arguing for that. So uh, we could uh, uh, put ourselves on, on the side of the argument This is that this is exactly what we want to do. Or we could also look at what, what else is there in the ITF that could solve that uh, particular uh, problem. Uh, so these are two different items and uh, people in the ITF has, haven't thought much about SDF style languages. They have thought a lot about uh, data definition languages like, like JSON schema org is trying to be. And uh, we might get more pushback for the second item than for the first item. So given, given that we at some point define what we actually want to standardize, the next uh, question is what is the right structure, organizational structure uh, to do this in. And most likely the best answer is to create a working group in the IETF applications area, which has recently been merged with the real-time area. That's why it's called ART for applications and real-time um, area. Um, so that would be a working group. That working group would uh, uh, work on one or more internet drafts that, that contain the specification would develop that in the working group and at some point to a working group last call and ship this to the uh, ISG. And uh, one thing I, I would like to, to stress at this point is uh, that it really helps to have implementation efforts uh, out there. Um, and and in, in the best case, uh, open source implementation efforts, but other implementation efforts also help. Um, so people can talk about the, the successes and, and issues uh, they have had in, in implementing and using um, this stuff. Uh, I think we need to be able to point to those implementation of efforts at the point in time when we actually ask for uh, creating a working group. So the, the way we get this working group is ultimately to run a BOF, which is a weird word the IETF uses for meetings in which we decide whether we want to take on some work or not. Uh, to do this, uh, we have to create a charter. A charter is a formal text that defines what the working group that we are creating is supposed to do. It often comes with milestones that, that specifically decide what the outcome is supposed to be. And uh, in, in order to survive in above, uh, we need to demonstrate interest so, so we, we need to demonstrate there is a chance people actually will implement and use this protocol and it's not just an academic exercise. And we also need to demonstrate that we have a chance to reach a consensus. So if there is lots of industry interest, but the industry simply cannot agree on something, that's not a good thing. Um, I think we, we are pretty well positioned for demonstrating the chance uh, for a consensus. Um, so uh, I think uh, that, that's not that hard, but I think we uh, uh, need to have convincing material and, and actual people clamoring for it uh, to, to get this uh, demonstration of industry interest. But by the way, <coughs> we also need to find working group chairs. Um, that's not necessarily our job. It's also something that the area directors, the, the people who run an IETF area <coughs> might be doing. Uh, it's probably a good idea to have some people in mind who could run this uh, uh, process in, in a reasonably detached way. That's why I'm writing that they should not be the authors, but they should be different people, maybe with some experience um, in this space. So, so let's all think about people who 
we might want to uh, do this. And final slide um, on the timing. Uh, the timing is very good with respect to the fact that a new ISG will be seated next week. Uh, that, that ISG will be stable for one year. We, we always exchange one half of the ISG uh, uh, every year. Um, so we, we have, will have a stable set of people to talk to. Uh, that's good. Um, the not so good thing is that the ITF is in this uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, state right now where the way we usually work is completely disrupted. And uh, most people who have a management role, and that of course includes the ISG, are very busy understanding how to continue to operate uh, in this environment. Uh, so it, it's probably not not uh, uh, very successful to go to the, the ladies next week and say we want to, this to happen. But maybe after a month or so, uh, we could be in a position to, to have these uh, discussions and to, to prepare uh, a little bit of consensus uh, that might lead us to have a buff at the next ITF. Now, the next ITF is in July. And uh, most people who understand what COVID-19 is tell me that there's no chance in, on the earth or in heaven or somewhere else that this will happen. Uh, but uh, I think by the time we, th this is supposed to happen, we will have a, a well-defined way to run this in a virtual way. So I think we, we should not be discouraged uh, by that. Uh, we could start uh, getting a consensus from from the, the people who run the ITF uh, about a month from now. Because we should have our ducks in a row in, in the way I described on the previous slides. Comments? You will be the first to ask. <laughs> no, no, no. no we'll, 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 speak. Yeah, let's, let's drip, us, drip us first. <laughs> Okay. Um, oh. but, but close. Um, but but what I want to highlight here is um, Carsten mentioned it takes a long time to get chartered and to get the first RFC out. That is true. But on the other hand, creating an ITF charter really focuses the scope with a lot of input and a lot of people asking you why is this not more precise and why are you putting this in scope and this and that. So the review process of chartering is also a good enabler even if we are not going to be chartered and therefore become a working group in the IETF. I think trying that and creating the charter focuses the work very well. And it is a good exercise uh, at the very least, at the very, very least. And in the best case scenario, we, we become chartered, we get chartered and, and become a working group. So uh, that is my, my uh, um, I have chartered only one thing, but that was a very, very good um, sharpening of, of the understanding of the problem, of the, the goals, etc. Well, I think we're well positioned with uh, um, uh, a chance for consensus. We have achieved quite a bit of consensus already, and we have a good working process that <clears throat> that it sort of results in closure, and we have a lot of stuff to deal with, but also, you know, I think we're in good shape there. And on implementation, I think we're in pretty good shape. So um, I don't think either of those is going to delay this. I, I think that uh, the time frame sounds about right to me uh, to, to come up with something. Um, thank you, Hank, for for that. Uh, I, uh, yeah, even if it doesn't go forward, we will have a, a hardened charter <laughs> and, a, and a good amount of review on our, our our other materials. So even if we have to do something else. We'll, we'll have a much better uh, starting place. So in the chat, <clears throat> Michael uh, mentioned that uh, we could uh, try to get an IAB buff mentor. Um, I think different people in this call have different experience. Yeah, that's a, that's a hit and miss, sorry. <laughs> this is a recorded meeting, so I'm not going beyond that, but uh, yeah. We could. 
So anyway, the first the the steps are um, to the the first engagement is with the BOF. So that's sort of the leading engagement with um, with IETF then. And for us to do our homework is create a charter and probably start working on what an ID would look like, and those the the, the things that Karsten had earlier in the slides about. You know, we were going to have to demonstrate processing model and things like that. So we can start working on that and create action items to develop that stuff right away. And um, it sounds like things might come together to get started sort of between now and the Madrid timeframe somehow. At best. Yeah, I think we, we need to talk to people. So, so there, there needs to be a lot of informal offline communication and <clears throat> in particular we have a new art ad which is coming in next week um i have tried to to keep him informed about what's going on here but i'm sure he will have lots of uh, questions so i think that that's one of the th first things uh, we should be doing try to to get an informal uh, meeting with the art uh, ad's about this and and try to gauge what their concerns uh, will be, uh, but uh, I think what what Michael said is also true that uh, it would be really good to have a, a dash zero zero internet draft, and that ha doesn't have to answer all the questions, uh, but it should uh, also identify where we already know that work needs to be done, and that that for instance includes the processing uh, model. Uh, so I think we 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 should use the next months to actually uh, get. Um, th this draft out there. Writing. <laughs> yes, I totally agree with that. So, um, okay. Uh, I, how how are we on time? It's just the end. This is the end, isn't it? Yes, as we are already in the wrap up phase. When are we going to do this again? And this being <laughs> uh, the IRTF. Um, this kind of workshop. IRTF one data model next step. Yeah, good, good question. Um, Seems like we could do this again before too long, like some time around this one month period even. The next IETF, the virtual IETF interims are gonna be mid-April, aren't they? They're all over the place because uh, we, we are trying to decompress the, this highly compressed physical meeting into virtual uh, meeting. So we have, slots for that until i think april 28th so that's when when we are going to be done with the virtual interims that replace the vancouver uh, meeting and we were lucky that that we didn't get into that uh, time period because we we are still before the uh, iatf um so uh yeah, I, I think we can do a, a research group meeting a little bit more independent of what, what happens at the IETF. So if we want to do this in April, uh, we could do that. Otherwise, it's probably early May. Well, early May is the um, one data model online conference tentatively scheduled. Okay, so we should have something in our hands by that time. Let's make that the checkpoint. Yep. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, sorry. So this is uh, Ege Korkan from Technical University of Munich, and I didn't know when to ask this question uh, precisely. Um, but uh, from the discussions, I see the work is uh, really closely related to the Web of Things thing description, and um, which also has the very similar model to the to the STFs model. And I couldn't um, like uh, see like what are like some more concrete differences, but then I maybe lack the experience. 
That's a great question because that will be one of the questions we will bombard, be bombarded with at the ITF. And uh, we, we need, need answers for questions like this. So yeah, and examples for how a one data model data uh, uh, definition gets used in a W3C thing description and how they work together. And, and hopefully even by then maybe some concrete examples of, of them actually working together. But uh, from what I understand, so the the model itself is um, is just a model in the end, and then the STF is the language. So the the model cannot be used since it's just a model. So um, well, it's a model. It's the same level of definition as the IoT schema. So it provides yeah. you with terms mm -hmm. that you can use to use as as semantic annotation in a thing description for events, actions, properties, and things. This is Michael McCool. I've been kind of quiet about this, but I'd like to comment. We should at least coordinate some activities. There's one thing in particular about the JSON schema that we definitely want to be using the same subset of JSON schema to be compatible. I think that's very important. Um, and I think we also, as Michael Koch has said, we need to work up some concrete examples to show the work, work together and where they are complementary. Uh, we are currently talking about uh, thing templates and about class definitions and you know pointing to things. So I can, I need to think we need to look at uh, how we uh, state formal relationship between the thing description and what it uses. We already have context though, so which may be sufficient if we're including a context. But I think there's also the issue of if the TD is an instance particular model, how do we say that? Um, I think uh, it would be nice if we didn't use different terminology as well. So if we can somehow, you know, uh, agree on common names for things that'll be helpful too. Um, just uh, make a list and then start figuring out uh, what we need to work on. Yeah, just a little uh, on on what uh, Michael Koster said, um, annotating thing descriptions with uh, like similar to IoT schema with um, one model uh, um, classes. So. Um, I mean, in thing description, we also have the the, the context file which contains the, the class uh, classes. So I can double annotate in a thing description already with the uh, by using its um, its 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 model. So it already has a model, and I can annotate with thing description model a thing description. So what would add uh, to a thing description if I annotate it now with one data model model? You get application specific class <clears throat> types. So, so you get a light switch or a light on off control or dimmer control or color control <clears throat> with its defined data types in and out. So it's, it's exactly like IoT schema. It defines the application layer types. It's the application vocabulary, if you will, for what type of thing you're describing that creates interoperability. So essentially it's, if I use <clears throat> semantic annotation that says, here's a thing description, this is a, <clears throat> a, a property in the thing description that is the uh, uh, on-off state property for a binary switch, then that's, that's where that definition comes from. So in, but this goes data, further than the than the property action event model of one data model. Goes, what goes further? So like I totally understand that we can like for a light switch we can add further annotations which are like more specific than just saying it's a property. Um, I totally agree. Um, just uh, but then this goes further than one DM's uh, property action event modeling. So. So this means you have more um, specific um, classes like an IoT schema. I so, think we, we are running out of time here. We are starting to lose uh, yeah. people. Sorry, yes. Um, so I, I think these are all great questions and, and uh, uh, we need to have this discussion. Uh, so uh, Michael Richardson's proposal was to uh, do uh, the same thing again on april 24th uh, at the same time we are not going to collide with 
um, IETF virtual interims on that date because th there are no virtual interims on Fridays. Um, so yeah, Friday may not be my favorite uh, time for this, uh, but I think it's the best thing, best way to get something done in April. Okay. Um, yeah, I would be happy to participate. Um, yeah, but, but I, as I said in the beginning, I couldn't just be sure when to discuss this. Um, so maybe we can have a like a clear session for this, um, like in the agenda or something. It could be only I don't know, fifteen, twenty minutes. Absolutely. Yeah, <clears throat> I think we, that we need to do that. The relationship between W three uh, C thing description and, in particular, the, this new idea. I, I forget how it's called. That, that there are actually classes of thing descriptions, templates or something. Yes. Um, I, I think we could uh, discuss that. And if we can find someone who can, can tell us about the uh, uh, templates. So Sebastian is also in the meeting. Um, that would be great. So can you okay. hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, hi everyone. Yeah, um, I have to double check. I am not sure if there's the Eastern break, but the Eastern break is uh, canceled anyway. <laughs> so um, it should be possible to join the next meeting in April. Yeah, but just let me out now the the, um, the appointment and then I can introduce the sync description template idea. Great. Okay. So we will have other things on, on the agenda and then we, of course, we have a mailing list to, to discuss uh, this. Uh, um, so we, we have some time preparing uh, this, uh, but I think we, we have uh, made some progress today and we just have to make sure that we write this up and, and have this available as uh, documents to refer to in the uh, working group process. Great, thank you. Ari, you are last words. Well, thank you, everyone. I think that was a very, very good summary, and I think we have a way forward. Roughly one month from now, hopefully, with uh, many of you getting taking kicks to next next level. And meanwhile, we'll continue to work on the the one DM group. So, with that, thank you for joining, everyone, and talk to you soon again. Hi. Bye. 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 Bye.